little bit again about what you do. Uh, sure, in general. Uh, so I am, my name is Dustin Bager. I'm uh, a high school science teacher and a dabbler in urban agriculture projects. So um, my lab studies two different components of plant-pollinator interactions. Uh, my work specifically looks at uh, food quality um, for, for pollinators, specifically for bumblebees, and what they need to make themselves happy and healthy. So looking at nectar quality and pollen quality and choices they make based on those, those components. I'm a bit of a chemical message. Or it interferes with their chemical well, message. Well, first it makes them think that there's a forest fire. And I coated it with icing sugar last week, and that coats the bees. And so what they do is they clean each other off. So all of these bees were all covered in sugar dust. It's a wasp. Um, they, they clean each other's backs off. Not only is it a nice tasty treat for them, but it cleans off some of the mites from their backs. Hmm. So that's part of what we do as our pest management. A large piece for me is, is around management and, uh, you know, not so much in the urban setting, um, or even so much in, Al in Alberta, but uh, if you go to the United States, I think it's something like 80, 90 percent of all of the hives in the country end up going to uh, California for the almond uh, blossoms, right? Mm -hmm. So you have very low diversity of food sources. You can't keep bees there year round because when the almonds aren't flowering, it's a desert, there's nothing for them to consume. You are, they're being exposed to pesticides for sure, but they're probably being exposed to those wherever they're at. And then what you have is a huge opportunity for the spread of disease. So, you know, take that outbreak that was in one particular state, you know, throw all the bees on trucks, send them all to California, let them mingle for a month or two, and now they all have it. We feed them as much as we can between now and whenever we close up the hives in a couple weeks. And so it gives them just a little extra boost and it also prevents them from eating the honey as food until it's winter when they have no other food sources. So here we go. Wow. First thing you do when you pull a frame of bees out is you look for the queen. I don't see the queen here. On there you see capped honey and some uncapped honey. The uncapped stuff isn't actually honey and so what the bees have to do to it is fan their wings on it to remove moisture. ways do bees impact our daily lives as humans? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, bees are important to every component of our daily lives. They produce, they're important for pollinating essentially all of the fruits and vegetables that we eat. So from the moment you get up until uh, the time you go to bed, anything you put in your mouth is probably closely related to pollination in some way. Even some of the products are animal products. So if you drink milk first thing in the morning, the cows that uh, produce that milk, we're probably foraging on flowers, those flowers were produced by pollinators. Um, the, the only major exception to that are grains, and grains are wind pollinated. So pollinators have a huge effect on, um, on our food production. Well, I mean, I can speak generally to it, uh, in that obviously if you have a pesticide or a chemical that's specifically designed uh, to target insects, and so anytime uh, an insect comes in contact with pesticide, it, it is, uh, it's going to have adverse effects. And so uh, I think in, in the case of pollinators, uh, you know, obviously if they get sprayed directly, they're, they're pretty much done. But what we're seeing is uh, these honeybees going out into the world and, and collecting from a variety of sources, and so potentially being exposed to a variety of different pesticides and different chemicals. And so I think one of the one of the challenges is uh, we perhaps know about a specific pesticide and how it might interact with an insect, but uh, we don't know as much about what multiple different types of pesticides uh, will do, even in small doses, uh, to, to insects. And so I All of the research that we have so far on neonicotinoids, so neonicotinoids are uh, this new-ish 
class of pesticides. They're actually developed um, originally trying to synthesize what plants naturally do to keep pests away. Um, they're based on nicotine um, synthesis, but they're artificial. Uh, and as you say, they're systemic pesticides, which means that they affect all of the plant parts. So one of the things that uh, we started to notice, we as a research community started to notice, was that these compounds are getting into fuel resources, and that can have an effect on pollinators. And there are a number of studies that are showing um, that pollinators are bringing neonics back to their hives, that they're being incorporated into uh, honey in the honey pots, into the um, wax in their hives, that the consumption of these compounds is reducing um, pollinator cognitive function, so their ability to learn and remember, um, and that it's affecting uh, reproductive output, so the number of queens produced in hives, especially in wild oh, bees. Okay. Uh, so there's mounting evidence to suggest that the neonics are uh, problematic for bee populations. So our major uh, issue right now with pollinator crisis is food production, definitely. And uh, because uh, we like to have diverse diets, because we don't just want to eat corn and rice, um, any reduction in pollinator populations, both wild and managed, is going to affect the diversity of what we can eat and the abundance of what we can eat. Um, but it's also going to affect sneaky things like the the coffee you drink is pollinated, and um, some of the crops that uh, produce alcohol and beer are pollinated. So it's not just what you eat, it's also what you drink. If you're, no good. <laughs> it, it could be all your other vices too. Many of your vices are associated with pollination in general. And so declines in pollinators are going to have significant effects on quality of life for people. And that's above and beyond the fact that declines in pollinators will have uh, trophic cascading effects in terms of ecosystem structure. So fewer pollinators means fewer plants, fewer plants means fewer animals, fewer Prey animals means fewer predators, and so we would see a huge cascade, I think, in terms of ecosystem function okay. if we lose all our pollinators. So a good example, there are a couple of good examples. One are mass flowering crops. So canola actually provides this huge um, burst in resources in mid-season for pollinators that may be uh, resource starved. All of a sudden there's nothing but nectar and pollen if you're hanging out near a canola mm -hmm. field. So in some ways, agriculture, although it has a lot of negative issues with pollinators as well, there are some positives. The other thing that humans have done that's been really good for pollinators is actually urban gardening. Um, the diversity and abundance of bees in cities is actually extremely high, and that's largely due to people putting beautiful plants in their garden and maintaining yeah. them. And so there have been some positive effects, definitely. Well, here, here's one of the things I'm really excited about, because um, in a city, we don't, we don't really think about this, but in a city, there's, uh, there's probably more diversity for, uh, for bees than in the country, and so in a city, because there's there's so much variety in our backyards, uh, in our boulevards, that you have a tremendous amount of uh, of diversity of food sources for for the bees, and so they actually do, I would argue, quite well in cities. Um, of course, the there's still pesticides, there's still chemicals in cities. Um, and so I would encourage people to not uh, use those whenever possible. I would encourage them to uh, you know, find, find alternative ways to do pest solutions or, or even weed solutions.